Hey, welcome to camp. Hi. I'm, I'm Mr. Dan, and I'm here with my assistant number one and my assistant number two. Hi. While the wolves are doing a backyard camp out, uh, they're learning about fire safety and camp stove safety, and uh, and I had wanted to do a cooking demonstration at a pat camp out, but unfortunately our spring camp out got canceled, and we're not having one this fall. So while we're out here doing our backyard camp, camp out for the wolves. I thought I would take you on a tour of our campsite and talk a little bit about camp cooking and some of the things you should think about. Um, for those of you who are new to camping, um, this will be a great introduction to kind of the things you should consider maybe uh, purchasing. And uh, for those who are uh, experienced campers, I'm going to talk about Dutch oven cooking, which is one way you can take your camp cooking to the, the really the next level. And uh, even for our wee blows who are getting ready to cross over to Boy Scouts, I'm going to talk about um, some considerations for uh, backpacking camping. We're going to go through kind of uh, beforehand uh, preparation, the different cooking methods, some of the things I think you ought to have and think about, and then we're going to talk about how to do uh, dishes the proper and safe way while at camp um, so that, uh, number one, you're, uh, you're, you're eating off of clean utensils and pots and pans, and uh, number two, we're not harming the, uh, the environment, okay? Because... Um, you know, part of being conservation-minded in the outdoor code is we should probably try to minimize, like, using lots of paper products, right? If we bring a bunch of paper plates, yeah, it's easier to deal with because we don't have to do the dishes or anything like that. Um, and maybe you don't know how to do dishes at camp. Well, now you're going to know. And so you can minimize some of that, uh, that paper waste that would otherwise get thrown away and go to a landfill somewhere. So we're going to go through all of that and more. I hope you're ready to join us. Food prep. Food prep is essential. Okay, if you want to have a great camp cooking experience, then you need to think ahead of time. There's no reason why you shouldn't be able to have pancakes or Cornish game hens or a pot roast or something like that out on the campsite, but you have to think about it ahead of time. All right, what do I do when I'm having pancakes? Well, number one, I keep it simple. All right, I buy a box of something like Aunt Jemima or Bisquick something where it's all pre-measured, okay? Then I look and I say, how many pancakes are we gonna have? Okay, and I look at the serving size and I scoop out whatever the amount is, whatever the amount of mix is I need for that amount of pancakes that I wanna make. I put it into a gallon Ziploc bag. Then I take a Sharpie marker and I write on the outside, pancake mix, add however many cups of water or oil or an egg or whatever you need, write that on the outside. Then when you're in camp, you don't have to think about it, Okay, you can add the liquid ingredients, you can add the wet ingredients, seal the Ziploc bag, and then just do the old shake and bake move. Shake up the bag with your hands. You don't even need a mixing spoon. Then when it's time to pour those pancakes onto the griddle, just take a pair of scissors or your pocket knife, snip one of the corners, and you can just pipe it right on, almost like a pastry chef would do. All right? And it's, uh, it's super simple. You don't need a ladle or a mixing spoon or a whisk or anything like that. And then at the end of the day, you can just take that plastic bag and toss it in the garbage, and you're done. That's the cleanup, okay? And if you're using a cast iron griddle, cleanup's probably going to be pretty easy uh, there, too. You just rinse it with some hot water and steam it right off, and you'll be all set, okay? So, um, so that's something to think about. And you can do that with anything, all right? Not just pancakes or something like that. But uh, pre-measure out all your spices before you leave home if you're going to use um, spices. If you um, if you have small containers that you can put things like cooking oil in and you need it pre-measured, do, do it like that. Okay, and just use a Sharpie or, or a dry erase marker to write on the outside or like a little label. Stick that on. Okay, these are the things you think about. They only take a couple extra minutes of pre-preparation and uh, your stomach uh, will thank you for it if you can have a nice real hot meal out at the campsite as opposed to, you know, ramen noodles and Pop-Tarts, all right? <laughs> We've all been there, okay? And there's nothing wrong with that. But at some point, um, it's worth the challenge, and it's certainly satisfying to make uh, something delicious out of the campsite. And there's just something about cooking over a fire or cooking over the camp stove that just seems to make it all taste better, all right? So those are some things to think about, some tips and tricks to pre-measure out you know, use those gallon Ziploc bags to your advantage. Measure it all out ahead of time and uh, just zip it up and Sharpie on there however much you need. 
And if you need measuring cups and measuring spoons, and mom doesn't want you taking the nice ones out on the camping trip, hey, I don't blame her. But you know what? You can get those things at the Dollar Tree for a dollar, okay? And you can get a whole set, and it'll be good enough, okay? And if they get lost, or they get broken, or whatever, it's no harm, no foul. It just costs you a dollar, okay? And you can replace them easily, okay? And then you don't have um, mom's nice stainless steel measuring spoons and measuring cups or uh, that nice uh, brand new Pyrex measuring bowl out there, okay? <laughs> and, uh, and, I, and I get it, all right? So those are some things to think about. Okay, so it's time to start thinking about how we're gonna pack up our food for our campsite, okay? And I recommend that you start the packing process, actually, or the preparation to pack process two days before you leave. So if you're leaving on a Friday, you should start this process on Thursday. The first thing that you're going to want is a actual camping cooler or something that's intended for camping. Okay, we're not talking about that cooler that you use to go for a day trip to the beach or to the lake or for tailgating. Okay, those may work for an for like one overnight, but if you're talking about a Saturday or a Friday to Sunday camping trip, it's just not going to cut it. Okay, you want Something, one, that's going to lock, because raccoons will get into anything and everything. If you don't lock it, if it doesn't have a latch to lock it, and even if it does, I recommend that you put something heavy on top once you're there, okay? Or lock it in a car or a bear box, okay? We'll get, we'll, we'll talk about bears more in just a second. But that's something that you want to have. Uh, that's a feature that's really kind of a must-have for a camping cooler. Number two, you want something that will hold ice for at least three days, okay? We're doing a typical weekend camping trip, Friday to Sunday, okay? Three days to hold ice. All right, that's what you want to look for. What do you not need? You do not need a $500 Yeti cooler, okay? You just don't, all right? If you, if you have one, good for you. If you can afford to buy one, it's great. But do you absolutely have to have one? No, you do not. And don't let anybody tell you that you need one, okay? Again, if you just want one, if you have one, that's cool. I can't personally justify spending that much money on a single cooler, okay? I just don't see the return on investment there, okay? Now, if you're going to go on a trip where you have to keep things refrigerated for maybe five to seven days, okay, maybe you're doing like a long canoe trip or... Um, or something like that, or maybe you go on a long RV trip where you don't have power, or or what have you. Okay, maybe um, maybe you're headed off to um, to scout camp, uh, like Boy Scout camp, and it's a week long summer camp type deal, and you want to do some cooking um, while you're there. Okay, now you're in a completely different class of coolers, something that's going to hold ice for five to seven days. Okay, and if that's what you need then you're going to pay for it, and something like a Yeti is going to be like pretty much the only uh, game in town. Okay, But that should not be what you, you need for your typical Cub Scout family camp out. Okay? You need something that locks, you need something that's going to hold ice reliably for maybe three days. All right. Now, what can you do to help uh, ensure that your food stays cold? Number one, pre-chill your cooler. Okay. Start chilling it maybe an hour or two before you load it up and then dump that old ice out and put new ice in. Number two, use large blocks of ice. Okay, I think we all probably have that bread pan that's sitting with the baking ware in our house that maybe we got as a wedding pre present or something like that and it probably does not get much use. All right, I don't know about your house, but we've got about 10 of them and they don't often get used. They do get used, but not very often. They kind of sit there and take up space. Well, let me tell you what, a bread pan is the perfect thing to fill up with some water if you're careful and you have room in your freezer to make giant blocks of ice. Those giant blocks of ice will melt slower and stay colder longer than individual cubes of ice. And you can make them for free as opposed to, you know, having to go buy bags of ice from the gas station on the way, okay? So that's kind of a, a tip for getting your cooler prepared. Okay, so you've got your ice, you've got some big blocks hopefully. Um, other things that work well are maybe um, if you
if you have an empty two liter bottle, you can uh, fill that with water, but you need to be careful with anything like that because water expands when it freezes. And if you have it filled to the brim and you put the cap on tight, it's going to explode. Right? So, um, you know, so that, that could be a problem. Um, you know, it's not going to hurt anybody, but you could have a mess in your freezer. So just be careful if, if that's the route you want to go. And it's, it's a fine option, you know, like frozen water bottles or uh, a two liter bottle filled with water and frozen. Um, just be uh, wary that you leave maybe a, um, a quarter to a third of that um, empty so that the water can expand into ice as it freezes. All right, so some good options there. Okay, how do you pack the cooler? It might, it might seem obvious, but if you've never thought about it, then you need to think about it, okay? Whatever is the most temperature critical, so if you've got like fresh meat, like maybe you're gonna do um, some Cornish game hens in a Dutch oven, that's an excellent camp dish, okay? Or a pot roast, all right? Um, if you've never considered those out of the campsite, then you should. Um, but something like that is going to require more critical temperature control than, say, orange juice and eggs or fruit, okay? Things like that we'd like to keep cold, but they don't necessarily have to be frozen. And if they warm up a little bit and it's just over the course of two days, it's really no big deal. Um, so pack your temperature critical items on the bottom and pack your most frequently used items on the top. So having a separate drink cooler is a good way to uh, minimize going in and out of that main cooler where you're trying to really keep the temperature at a cold and consistently cold level. And if you're on a, an extended trip, like maybe over the summer, that's a good way to ensure that that ice stays as ice and doesn't um, melt quicker than you'd like it to. All right, so it's just some things to think about. <clears throat> what about bears? Bears are a real concern here, especially in Virginia, and really most of the country, even where I grew up in Central Florida, um, there were bears um, out in like the Ocala National Forest, and you had to take that into consideration. Now some places, like if you're camping in Shenandoah, they're going to have a metal bear box in most of their campsites, okay, or something like that available, <clears throat> and if they don't, you might, you're going to want to put that stuff in your car, okay. Um, now, if you're backpacking out here, you don't have a car to lock things up in, and you don't have a big metal box that you can lug around with you. So what do you do? You make a bear bag, all right? Don't have your bear bag be your backpacking backpack, all right? <laughs> because if something is to get into there, then your brand new or your nice, you know, $200 hiking backpack just got ripped to shreds, all right? And that's not good. So, what's a bear bag? It doesn't really have to be anything fancy. It's just a drawstring bag, okay, uh, is really kind of the best thing to use. A drawstring bag with a rope tied to one end and then a big loop over a tree branch that's hung out five to ten feet from the trunk, somewhere where a bear that climbs up the trunk is not going to be able to reach it, and it's up off the ground, you know, ten to fifteen feet, where it can't reach it from the, from the ground standing up, and that's going to keep your food safe. Okay, so keep it suspended in the air. Then just tie off the other end with a stake or something or to a, another low tree limb where you can untie it. Use something like a, like a half hitch knot that's gonna, uh, you're gonna get undone easily or like a clove hitch. Okay, those are two perfect knots to use for something like that. Um, and that will help keep your food safe. And, uh, and that might be something you have to do even if you're just car camping and a bear box isn't available and maybe you've got something like a soft shell Jeep or like a convertible with a soft shell top and you don't want to take the chance of putting something in your car, in your vehicle, and then having something tear that open. All right, that would be, uh, that'd be a bad thing. All right, so a bear bag. Think about it. Um, it's, a, it's a useful thing, and uh, if you're going backpacking, it's absolutely required. All right, so if you're going car camping, one of these camp stoves right here is going to be your best friend. And when I say car camping, I mean basically your typical Cub Scout family camp out where you can drive your car up to the campsite, right? Weight is not really an, an issue, neither is size. Um, and so, um, you know, there are some different brands out here, but, um, you know, and, and obviously we're not sponsored by Coleman or anything like that. We don't get anything back. But I'll just tell you personally, I think that uh, Coleman is probably your best bang for your buck in terms of just number one, sheer price, and then number two, reliability and value over the lifetime of the, uh, over the stove. Um, and what I recommend doing is 
just put all your stuff into a, uh, a tote bin like this. It's the perfect way to keep all of your camp gear together. Uh, all your cooking gear, have one for cooking. That way you can just throw it in the back of the car and pull it with you. You don't have to sort through or anything like that. You'll have everything that you need to have. Let's talk for a minute about camp stove safety, okay? These stoves are super handy to have. <clears throat> like I said, I think in terms of uh, camp cooking to get you started, this should probably be one of your first investments uh, because you can use it for just about everything. <clears throat> okay, they run off of uh, propane. You can get the little tanks right there. That's kind of the standard setup. Um, if you already have one of these um, and you want to sort of take it to the next level of camp cooking, um, take a look at getting a propane uh, tank tree, a distribution tree. Uh, and what that is, if you've never seen one or heard of one, it takes your, your big propane tank from your gas grill and it's a big bar, a big tube that uh, screws on, connects, and then it's got several outlet ports that are, um, that are this size. And uh, you can use that so usually they have one on top, so that's the perfect place to put a lantern. Uh, because you know in the winter months that uh, that sunset comes quicker than you expect when you're cooking dinner or if you're uh, cleaning up afterwards you'll have somewhere you'll have some light right here by the stoves to see what you're doing so you can have the the lantern up on top then you can have another hose running off to hook up your stove um, so uh, I don't have one but um, but I'd like to get one and I think that they're worth the investment especially when you consider that um, these little tanks now they go for maybe like seven dollars a pop at Walmart and when you're done with them you have to throw them out whereas you can get that uh, big tank that you probably already have hooked up to your grill um, and a refill of that is gonna la is gonna cost maybe 20 bucks um, and uh, and one of these tanks uh, if you're cooking a lot will maybe last you one weekend okay and if you're using your lantern a lot at nighttime you know that's just gonna burn up uh, fuel pretty quickly so um, you know I think within the matter of maybe two, two full weekend campouts, um, a, a propane tank tree system would probably pay for itself in terms of just a disposable propane tank cost. <clears throat> All right, now um, camp stove safety. Um, I talked to the wolves about it a little bit, but um, since we're making this uh, video for the pack, I wanna just take a minute to address this specifically. All right, um, and this is, uh, if you're interested, uh, this is part of the Call of the Wild adventure for the wolves, um, and I'm sure that uh, the other uh, uh, books have something similar. Um, I believe that uh, the Bear Scouts have a uh, camp cooking uh, adventure specifically. All right, so when you're lighting one of these things, number one, these, these stoves typically do not have electronic ignitions in them. So that means you've got to use like a match or a lighter. Um, I recommend a lighter. Uh, because uh, you don't, some of these things can flare up, and um, there's not a lot of finesse to the knobs. Okay, and this is pretty much across the board. It doesn't really matter the brand. You know, it's easy to go from, you know, off to a giant flame pretty quickly, and you've got to really, really tweak what you're doing here. So, number one, uh, the first rule is Cub Scouts should not be hooking up the fuel themselves if you have kind of the old school kind with the fuel tank in the front where you pour like a liquid fuel in. Okay, you should absolutely not be doing that by yourself. Shouldn't be hooking up the tanks or disconnecting the tanks, okay? Uh, older boys, you know, Weeblos getting ready to cross over to Boy, Boy Scouts you can help out, but shouldn't be doing it by yourself, okay? Um, with adult supervision at all times during Cub Scouting events, okay? Number two, uh, Cub Scouts shouldn't be lighting these things by themselves either, okay? Uh, especially for the younger boys, it's like I just described, it can be a little bit uh, dangerous, okay? You can get a big flare-up pretty easily um, until you kind of get the hang of it. All right, and then um, the other thing when you're lighting this, always, always light your, your ignition source first before you turn on the burner, okay? You know, have your lighter going, okay? Have the flame, then turn on the stove, okay? Otherwise, you could get a flare-up. Um, other uh, camp stove safety rules, and uh, and this is not just uh, particular to stoves in general, but anytime you're cooking over an open flame, whether you're at home with a gas range, you're cooking on the grill, or uh, maybe over an open fire pit, um, make sure that you're not wearing any loose, dangling uh, clothing. If you ha if you've got long sleeves on that are that are kind of baggy or loose, roll them up, okay. 
Um, if you have long hair, pull it back underneath a ball cap or back in a ponytail or something like that. Basically, you don't want anything to get caught and drop in that uh, flame. Um, and, uh, and boys, remember, if your clothes do catch on fire, stop, drop, and roll. Okay, and if you're near somebody whose clothes catch on fire, grab a blanket, put the blanket on the flames, pat the blanket down, that'll smother the fire quickly, um, and then you can administer first aid from there. Okay, so those are some things to think about when operating a camp stove and cooking over an open flame. Okay, it may not look like it, but what I've got right here, and this is kind of for the Weeblos who are getting ready to cross over to Boy Scouts, this, this little tiny thing right here, this is a camp stove too. This is a backpacking stove. And this is the fuel canister that goes with it, okay? This brand is, uh, is MSR, and uh, it's the same brand fuel here. And this one works great. Um, these camp stoves are obviously a single burner. It's just enough to fit like a small mess kit um, frying pan or pot on top of. And uh, they come in a couple different varieties. And um, I'm gonna recommend that if you're investing in a backpacking stove, um, and hopefully you're doing some backpacking as Boy Scouts. That was my favorite part of being a Boy Scout. You go for a model like this, and let me tell you why. They have other ones. Um, they're a little bit bigger, and you can get a little bit bigger flame out of them. And that can be handy, but the problem is you actually have to pour liquid fuel into those. And usually that uh, comes in uh, like a big gallon of butane, okay? Now, there are some pros to that. Number one is, okay, these things are expendable, but you can't refill them, okay? So you use it up and then you throw it away, okay? So, you know, in terms of a scout is, you know, clean and conservation-minded and all that stuff, okay, this is um, sort of more waste involved with this. All right, so that's one thing to consider. And then cost-wise, um, this stove is probably cheaper, but the fuel is gonna be more expensive over the long run. Like I said, you can buy about a gallon of that butane of that camp stove fuel, and that'll last you like for your lifetime, pretty much. Okay, because I don't know how many back, how many backpacking trips you're planning on going on, and you guys are probably going to be like me when I was a kid and just boil water for ramen noodles. So you're not talking big, major, involved meals. Okay, but uh, but let me tell you why I prefer this, even though it does have some drawbacks, um, and it really comes down to the fuel. Okay, the fuel here is self-contained. Okay, you pop off this cap. And it's got a little, it's got a little um, a nozzle there. Okay, there's nothing you have to refill. There's no way that the fuel can leak out, and um, and that's a big plus. It's also pre-pressurized. Okay, with the other ones that you fill up with the liquid fuel. Okay, number one, you know, like I said, yeah, you can get more fuel cheaply, and you can refill, you can refill it, and you've got less waste because you're not uh, throwing away these fuel canisters. Um, but I can't tell you how many times I had fuel leak out or something like that, and that's just not a good situation. You don't want camp fuel uh, spilling on your backpack or on your clothes. You certainly don't want it mixing in with your food, and you know, I never had that happen to me, but it's just, it can be kind of messy. And, and also, um, you have to pump those up by hand, and then you screw it down, and it's a whole process. I mean, it's not too involved, obviously. That's what I had when I was a kid. And it, it worked out just fine, but it's um, it's just much easier. This is all self-contained, and um, and I think that you'll be a lot happier. So let me show you how this goes together. Okay, so you open the lid, and this is what you see on the inside. So let's pop it out. There we go. All right, and here's the corresponding fuel nozzle on the back here. Okay, and uh, this little guy that I just popped out. Uh, this is the uh, the fuel control, okay? You just fold these legs down, okay? These legs fold down, right? And these are actually not even legs. They look like they're legs, but this is actually the, uh, the burner support, okay? So the base becomes the leg. So you just screw this on top, okay? And then your pot sits on top, top of these like little legs, okay? So it doesn't go like this. It goes like this. And then you use this little... Um, wire loop that controls the valve and you open and close okay and like I said the benefit here is this is already pre-pressurized it's ready to go it's self-contained it's never gonna leak okay um, and the footprint of this stove is also much smaller um, so 
you know, that is one, one kind of nice thing about this. Um, for backpacking, you might want to split up your gear, okay? Um, normally, with, uh, with Boy Scouts, you're going to have like a, a tent buddy or something like that, okay? So, you want to think about weight distribution between those two packs. So, what you might want to do is, you might want to say, hey, I'll carry the, uh, the stove and I'll carry some of the food. You carry the fuel. Okay, that's one way to save some room in your pack. Um, and you'll, you'll want to do the same thing with your tent too, right? Like maybe one guy carries the tent, the other guy carries the poles, okay? So think about um, portability, right? With those other stoves, the other style where you fill the fuel up, the fuel tank is attached, okay? So you've got something about this footprint anyway, which is not unreasonable. Yeah, you can find room for that in your backpack, but it doesn't come apart. So this gives you a little bit more option for storage, a little more flexibility. Um, and, uh, and I think it's just a better system all around because you don't have to worry about refilling fuel, fuel leaks, um, pressurizing it, pumping it up, anything like that. It's just, it's ready to go. It works well. It works the first time. Um, it works pretty much every time. So that's a quick rundown on backpacking stoves. All right, let's talk about Dutch oven cooking. If you want to take your uh, camp cooking to the next level, you should seriously consider investing in a Dutch oven, okay? These things have been around since the colonial days, and despite the name, this Dutch oven style right here is distinctly American. The, uh, the three legs on the bottom and the lip around the top for holding coals on top and being above coals on the bottom. That was uh, a distinctly American invention. Um, you might be uh, familiar with uh, Dutch ovens that are maybe um, enamel uh, that are used in your oven at home and uh, those are sometimes referred to as French ovens, okay? And this is different, okay? This is the style you want for camping and the reason is, well, like I just said, you want to be able to put coals on the bottom and you want to be able to arrange them on the top and you want to be able to check this thing with this rim so they don't fall off or into what you're cooking. Okay, so this Dutch oven, as you can see, this is different, and this is more typical of like what you might find in a typical um, uh, culinary store, right? Maybe like something like Williams Sonoma. Okay, you're gonna have um, no ridge along the top to hold coals and no feet on the bottom. Okay, and this a pot like this is fine for using in an oven or for using on a stove, like I'm doing right here. And you notice these dimples on the bottom of the uh, lid, and um, if you make something like a pot roast or, uh, or you throw a chicken in there, the uh, moisture will evaporate up and then con uh, condense on those dimples and sort of rain down um, just all that uh, flavory goodness on whatever you're cooking. So those can be handy um, for like cooking in the home or using as a normal pot like this, but not really the same kind of thing that we're talking about. Looks like my coffee's uh, bubbling over there. there. So. <laughs> All right, so these are these are great for the oven at home. These are great for using on a stove like this, but this is not the kind of Dutch oven that I'm talking about and the kind that I'm going to show you how to use over here. Okay, the kind of Dutch oven I'm talking about is this kind with the ridge on the lid and the feet on the bottom. And I'm going to show you exactly why you're going to need that, and that's to hold the charcoal. And speaking of charcoal, I think just about everybody's seen one of these before. This is a charcoal chimney. If you haven't, um, this is the best way to get your charcoal going quickly for dinner, okay? It's gonna, you put a little kindling in the bottom, whether that's rolled up newsprint or just some pine cones or something like that. You throw your charcoal on top, it's lifted up, and then these air holes allow the fire to breathe. It goes up through, and it'll get your charcoal going really, really fast. Um, and in terms of you know, um, uh, what kind of charcoal should you use? Okay, um, you know, I love my, uh, my egg grill and, uh, and I'm, I'm a big fan of smoked meats and I would never use charcoal briquettes for something like that, but when you're using a Dutch oven, um, you already have sort of an unknown in terms of uh, heating and, and heat evenness and the distribution of heat through that pot. So um, I recommend that you do use the charcoal briquettes for something like that, okay? And I'm going to show you why here in just a minute, okay? So get yourself a charcoal chimney, get the briquettes, okay? Plus they're easier to trans transport and they're cheaper, okay? And that will uh, do you just fine for Dutch oven cooking. So let me get this started and then I'll come back to you when these coals are ready 
and, um, and we're ready to bake some cornbread. So I'm going to do a cornbread in this Dutch oven and we're going to do some uh, vegetarian chili in this one. All right. We get a fire going. Um, how are you going to get that done quickly? Well, you could buy some fire starters from the store. Those work fine. Okay, nothing wrong with using one of those. Or here's a handy thing you can make with some leftovers that you probably already have laying around the house for sure. And, uh, and one added secret ingredient. And um, see if you can guess what this is. All right, so here's what you need to, to do this. All right, so you're going to need an egg carton. And here I've got an egg carton split in, down the middle. And then inside, I don't know if you can guess what this is. This is lint. This is lint from the dryer. Okay, so that's stuff that, that you pull off of the screen in your dryer. Okay, you might not know it if, uh, for the kids, but this stuff is extremely flammable. And that's one reason why you always have to clear that out of your dryer. You don't want to have a, uh, a fire, okay, which can happen if this stuff builds up in there and then it gets too hot, okay? So ask your mom if you can set some of this aside. And you don't need much, okay? This is like maybe half of a dryer load from like some sheet from some towels or something like that okay um, so pull some lint stick it into the little egg cup now let me just stress cardboard egg cartons okay don't use styrofoam or plastic or anything like that okay you got to use cardboard something that's going to burn cleanly and not have any uh, plasticky toxic vapors okay and then if you didn't know what this was it looks kind of like a bar of soap it's actually paraffin wax okay Golf Wax, I think, is probably the most common brand. Um, you can find this like in the canning aisle of a grocery store. You can also get it um, on Amazon, which is where I think I got this, right? What can't you get on Amazon? It's, it's super cheap, so all you do is, um, if you've got a double boiler, um, you can melt this down and then pour the wax over this. Um, you can break these off and you can actually just tie a string around it, maybe like some butcher's twine and then just dunk it down in that wax and really coat it. Now you've got, okay, paraffin is, uh, is flammable, but it's also, it's wax, so it's waterproof. So now you've got a highly flammable, waterproof fire starter. So this is the perfect thing to get that fire going in the morning, or um, if you've got some, some maybe some damp uh, wood, right? You got some kindling and some damp wood, and you have one of these fire starters, that's gonna get your fire going pretty quickly, I guarantee you, okay? and. It's stuff that you can use from around the house, right? I guarantee you, you have these things, I'm sure, already on hand. All you need is this um, golf wax, this paraffin wax, and this stuff is super cheap and, uh, and relatively easy to come by, okay? Um, so another option for starting that fire. All right, so we've got our Dutch oven preheating, and um, preheating a Dutch oven is uh, absolutely crucial. In fact, um, when you're cooking with any cast iron, you want to make sure that the pan or the pot is uh, well preheated before you put anything in. That's one of the keys to not getting the food to stick to it, okay? Um, think of it like stainless steel cookware if you have that at home, all right? Um, and uh, you see I've got my coals arranged here, uh, kind of evenly spaced out on top, and I've got some in a similar pattern on the bottom. Now, um, let's talk about coals, okay? Earlier I told you charcoal briquettes are going to give you the best even heat. And here's an excellent formula that you can use. Okay, so these Dutch ovens come in different sizes and um, they're really not measured by volume, although they come in standard volumes. Um, what you really are concerned about is the diameter in inches. This happens to be a 10 inch Dutch oven. And, um, you know, this is probably a little bit on the small end for like a family of four. If you're gonna go and invest in a Dutch oven, I would recommend a 16 inch, but this is an old one that I've had for a long time. And uh, when it was just two of us, it worked great. Okay, so, um, so what you do is you take the diameter, in this case 10 inches. Now we know that um, most things are baked at 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, that's kind of the magical baking temperature, okay? Um, so to get to pretty close to 350, you're gonna use the rule of three. Uh, heat rises, so you're going to have less on the bottom and more on the top. And using the rule of three, you take the diameter, you add three for the top, and you subtract three for the bottom. So I've got, um, so you would do 10, 10 inches plus three is 13 coals on top, and 10 inches minus seven is seven, or minus three is seven coals for the bottom. And that should get you pretty close to 350. Tonight we're making some cornbread in the Dutch oven, so we're actually going to be 
trying to shoot for about 400. So I've added three more coals to the top and I've added two to the bottom. And I'm hoping that should get us pretty close to 400 degrees. And I've got my uh, chimney over here with some extra coals just in case we need to add a little bit more. Um, some tools you're going to want for your Dutch oven are um, a pair of uh, cheap metal tongs to move the coals around. And then um, something like this. This is actually a tent stake puller, but it works great for picking up that hot lid and not burning your hand. Something else you might want to have on hand is um, a pair of heavy-duty uh, leather welder's gloves. Um, you can find those pretty cheaply, like on Amazon, and uh, those can be useful for helping to pick this up, and they're a little bit more durable than your standard oven mitt. All right, so we're going to let this preheat, and then uh, I'll show you what to do when you're actually baking something. Okay, we've got our Dutch oven preheated. We've got our batter mixed up for our cornbread. So I'm going to use my lid puller here to uh, take the lid off. Put the handle down. All right, carefully pull it off. Preheated. And what I've got inside here is a parchment paper Dutch oven liner, which is what you want to keep this from not sticking. All right, bud, you want to go ahead and pour that in? Yeah, but first you gotta get most of it. No, you don't need to worry about that. Just pour it right on in. Just be, just get nice and close to the pot. It's not gonna hurt. Pour it all in. Very good. Down close to the pot. Down close to the pot. Hold that mixing bowl down. All right. Whoa, bud. All right. Right over the pot. There you go. This is really nice. hard. Hey, hey, Dad, can I have a little? Yep. Okay, we've got our, uh, our batter in there. A little bit splattered out, that's okay. We're learning how to cook here. So just remember when you're pouring stuff into a, a pot like that, you wanna, don't be afraid to keep the bowl close to the lid and use a spatula to help scrape that stuff out nice and careful. Now we're gonna let this sit for a couple minutes and then um, just make sure you got a nice good seal on the lid. And what you wanna do is every, um, for like a long cook every 15 minutes or so, but this one goes for about 20 minutes, so I'm gonna do it every five minutes. We're gonna rotate the lid 90 degrees one direction, and then we're gonna pick up the pot and rotate that the opposite direction. The idea is we wanna minimize any hot spots that might happen from one coal being hotter than the other or maybe getting moved around, something like that. So we're gonna let that go and then we'll come back and see how it looks. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to rotate. We're going to rotate this another, about another 90 degrees to the right. And then I'm going to rotate my pot another 90 degrees or so to the left. All right. We look, looks like we're doing pretty good. So I'm going to put another five minute timer on here. And uh, check back in. It smells great. All right, so you had your dinner, you had your meal, hopefully it was good. Now it's time to clean up, right? And we already talked about why we should learn how to do dishes properly at camp. Number one, how do we do it safely to protect the environment? Number two, let's think about re maybe using some uh, reusable uh, plates and bowls so that we're not uh, filling up the landfills with lots of paper products, okay? So that brings me to cleaning up at camp. And while to you, this might look like some uh, some plastic bins in a pot, uh, this is my camp dishwasher. So let me show you how it works. Having a nice pot like this is uh, really kind of invaluable for camping. And when I say nice, I mean like cheap and of a good size, okay? This thing I think I picked up at Walmart for like next to nothing. And it's there's nothing fancy about it, but it's a pretty good sized pot. It holds a little over a gallon of water. Um, and let me tell you why you should have one of these. Number one, there's not too much you can't make in something like this. Um, boiling water is... Uh, is a must for camping, whether you're talking about um, you're gonna make some instant coffee, some hot chocolate, um, or wash dishes. And then after all that's done, if you have a campfire, you need some way to extinguish it. And uh, you can fill this up with a, some water from, this, from the spigot at the campsite, set it down next to your fire, and you're good to go, right? So this is very versatile. Um, and uh, you know, if you had to, you could even fry some eggs or maybe some uh, corned beef hash or something like that in the bottom. Okay, so pretty versatile. You just have to be creative and think about think outside the box a little bit. So what else do we have here? We've got our box. I've got this Stairmine tablets, which is actually a, a sanitizer, okay? And then I've got this uh, Camp Suds 
um, soap. Okay, you don't necessarily have to have this brand or this kind, but uh, I'll talk a little bit about why I have this one. And then I've got some uh, some plastic buckets here, and these ones are a little bit dirty because they've been sitting in my my camp box for a little bit. But here's how here's how it works. You need you need three vessels. Okay, um, they don't have to all be bins like this. Okay, but but it helps. The other thing you're going to want is a scrubber. Okay. Um, I picked this one up because it was honestly the cheapest one I think I saw at Giant. I don't use the, um, the, uh, the handle here which you can fill with uh, soap, but just some, something with the nylon bristles here, um, maybe an old bottle brush, okay, um, for those who've got younger ones around. One of those will work out fine. Just something like this. Um, maybe stay away from the sponges because those don't dry out very quickly. Um, and you don't want to do like steel wool because if you have cast iron, stuff that you're using that'll that'll damage it. Um, the green scotch Brite pads, those work okay too, but again that can sort of take off that protective enamel from your uh, cast iron pans. So um, really one of these nylon bristled scrubbers is just about perfect, okay? So, so here's how the system works. And I like to use this pot, okay? Especially if I'm not cooking it in it. Because what you need is you need a bucket of hot water, you need, and then you need two buckets of cold water, okay? So the bucket of hot water you get going, okay? And into that bucket of hot water, um, I put about two or three drops of this soap. This camp soap right here is highly concentrated, okay? And you only need a couple drops. And it's also biodegradable, so that's an advantage there. Um, regular dish detergent like Dawn or something like that, that'll work out fine too. Um, especially if you're at a campsite where they have some sort of a um, uh, like a large wash basin where you can dump your uh, wastewater into. This stuff you can dig a little hole, pour it into the ground, and it's not going to hurt the environment um, or anything like that. So, and you don't have to use much of it, right? A little goes a long way. Like this should last you for years. Okay, this amount right here may not look like it. Um, so that goes into the bottle, to the pot with the hot water. Okay, and when you take your plates over, first of all, before they go anywhere near the pot for uh, cleaning, you want to scrape off all the excess food, okay? And uh, here's a little tip for the, for backpacking, right? So for you Weeblos, when you go backpacking as Boy Scouts, what you want to do is take your mess kit that you're eating out of, right? Number one, try to do one pot uh, meals where you eat out of the same pot that you cooked in, okay? What you want to do is pour a little water into that uh, pan, swirl it all around, and just kind of drink up the rest of whatever's in there, okay? It might sound kind of gross, it's not going to hurt you. Um, it's a good way to clean out the pan, and it's also a good way to get some extra calories in for those long hikes, okay? So that'll, uh, that's, a, that's just a little pro tip for backpacking, okay? So, but for normal car camping, just um, scrape it off, put it in the suds, wash, and this is where you're trying to get all the food chunks off, okay? So you're getting all the chunks off, getting all the chunks off here in the soapy water, okay? Scrub it, scrub it, scrub it, get all the stuff off. Okay, now take it out, then it goes over to the next basin. This basin's just going to be plain cold water, okay? And you're just going to rinse off the soap here, okay? So rinse it off in this one. Then your third one, this is also going to be cold water, it doesn't really matter. Um, this one's going to have some of this sterilizing agent in it, okay? I've got these tablets because, um, number one, they're, they are tablets. Um, it's easy to, to do the right ratio if you've got different amounts of water. So this is two tablets per one gallon of water. Um, there are some other products you can use, like um, a lot of uh, home brew stores um, for, um, for adults who, who, who want to brew beer and stuff like that at home or make wine. will sell sanitizing agents very similar to this or powder packets. Those work perfectly. Um, and then if you want to go the ultra simple route, you can do like one or two tablespoons of bleach in with some water. Um, but let me tell you why I like this over the bleach route, okay? Number one, um, it's just, well, it really just comes down to safety, okay? You don't want to be fooling around with bleach. And what I'm trying to do here is describe things that would be best for, for Cub Scouts to do on their own, okay? These tablets are not corrosive at all, okay? You don't have to, you know, you shouldn't ingest them, but you don't have to worry about um, like getting it on your skin or anything like that. It just goes in the water and dissolves. It's very, it's very similar to those um, like little dye tablets that you use for coloring Easter eggs. It just pops in, swirl it around, okay, and then you're good to go. Um, 
The other downside to bleach, uh, aside from the, the corrosiveness, you know, it can burn your skin, it's messy, if you get it on your clothes, you, you know, you bleach your clothes, okay, it's got a lot of downsides there. The other, the other major downside, that the reason that I really don't have it is because I like to use my cast iron Dutch ovens, and uh, bleach and iron do not mix, okay? Uh, bleach will, will rust metal faster than, than you can say, you know, one, two, three. Um, so, um, so try to stay away from the bleach, although it's, you know, there's nothing wrong with using it if you've got plastic pots or, um, or like nonstick pans, anything like that. It's certainly economical, right? A, a gallon of bleach is probably less than the cost of this bottle. It'll last you forever. You can use it for all kinds of things. And if you have a way to safely um, pour it, store it, and transport it on the campsite, then by all means, go ahead and use it. Um, but this is just a camp-specific option that has a, um, it's safer to use, it's easier to transport. Um, kids can use it safely under supervision. You know, Boy Scouts can use it, you can, and it's not gonna damage your cast iron cookware. So, um, so that's the way you do it. So, sudsy water, get off all the food, clean water, rinse off all the soap, and then soak in a sanitizing agent to kill all the germs. And once you're done with that, pull it out, let it dry. And that's how you do dishes at camp. It's that simple, guys. Uh, this will keep you safe, okay? It'll keep your pots and pans clean. It'll keep extra paper products out of the landfill. Um, and, uh, and it'll keep you from uh, getting a stomach ache from, you know, having leftover dried food that went bad or rancid or something like that, something stuck on. This is a good way to make sure that you've got everything cleaned off, cleaned up, and sanitized and ready to go for the next meal. Okay. Okay, so let's talk a little bit briefly about um, where you're going to acquire your, camps, uh, your camp cooking utensils and uh, vessels and all that good stuff, okay? Obviously, there's a lot of stuff out there, a lot of different products, um, and if you go down the camp camping aisle of, uh, of any given store, whether that's Walmart or REI or something like that or, or um, Bass Pro Shops, you're bound to run into a ton of gimmicky devices uh, or, or products, okay? Um, a lot of single-use niche items that um, they're going to try to sell you on something like, hey, you really need this gadget, this little this doohickey. Um, it's special for camping, okay? <laughs> a lot of times those things are, are overpriced, okay? Sometimes they're not, but a lot of times they are. So a scout is thrifty, right? So how can you acquire your camp cooking setup if you're new to camping? or uh, maybe you're getting ready to cross over to Boy Scouts and you want to start putting together um, some gear for your patrol, okay? Hopefully your, your troop has some stuff like in a closet to share, but, but maybe not, okay? Um, so how are we going to acquire these things? Well, number one, the most obvious and easiest way to do this is if you're getting rid of your old pots and pans from your kitchen in your house, set a couple aside and save those for camping. Grab one of those uh, Rubbermaid tote bins like I showed you, stick them in there, now you're ready to go. Um, you know, people don't replace their, their whole pots and pan sets very often, but, um, but pretty frequently, okay, people don't um, replace their pots and pan sets very often, but, but very frequently, people will um, have like a non-stick frying pan that's not part of the set, okay? Um, and um, for one reason or another, those things just don't seem to last very long, especially like the Teflon coated ones. And so you end up going through these frying pans, um, you know, every couple years maybe. Um, so there's an opportunity to grab a frying pan to put in the camps uh, in the camp bin, okay? Um, and if the nonstick is, you know, not so nonstick anymore, that's fine. Just pack a can of Pam or a little bit of um, cooking oil with you, okay? And that'll solve that problem. And, you know, you're, you're just doing camp meals anyway. You're probably frying stuff like bacon or sausage for breakfast, okay? Or maybe um, burgers for dinner. And those things have a lot of natural grease in them anyway, so they're, they're going to be tough to get burned on and stuck, uh, just as a general rule, based on the, uh, the food product itself. Okay, so, so keep that in mind. Um, what are some other options? Don't discount the dollar store, okay? The Dollar Tree has got all kinds of great stuff in there for dirt cheap, you know, one dollar, okay? You can find spatulas, spoons, mixing cups, uh, measuring spoons, maybe some food storage containers like Tupperware type stuff. Um, I'm sure you can find pots and pans 
um, if you need uh, coffee mugs or, or plastic plates and bowls, things like that, things that you can wash and reuse, okay, I'm not talking disposable here, um, that's the perfect place to peck, pick up a couple things. It doesn't need to be some sort of like Coleman or Stanley brand camping, um, you know, cutlery set or anything like that, okay? You know, if you're going on a backpacking trip or something like that, you may want to invest in something a little bit more specific like a mess kit um, that's going to be compact and lightweight and have a lot of small things that you can cook like a one person kind of meal with. Okay, but that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about Cub Scout camping, car camping, okay, kind of just getting started with a basic camp cook set. So, um, you know, so take a look at the camping stuff in the camping aisle, but you know, be, be wary of the gimmicky single-use items and the high prices that you're going to find there. Be thrifty about it. You know, see if you've got some old stuff laying around the house that maybe you're going to toss anyway, that maybe you're going to donate. Um, you know, you can always go to like a second-hand or a consignment shop and look for um, pots and pans and stuff like that there. You don't need a whole lot, really, okay? You need like one pot to boil water. Um, for maybe making oatmeal or something like that and you're gonna need some sort of like a frying pan or a griddle okay um, and I recommend a cast iron griddle especially if you have one of those camp stoves it fits across both burners it's the perfect size Lodge makes a great one it's like 30 bucks that that cast iron cookware if you treat it right will last generations you know there's no reason why if you don't treat a piece of cast iron cookware correctly whether that's a Dutch oven a frying pan or a griddle that your great great grandchildren shouldn't be able to use the same thing if you take care of it and pass it down okay so that's a that's a solid investment you just have to learn how to cook with it and care for it 